Hey there everyone! You know what time it is. Time for me to respond to these nice little questions you've asked me on the uh, Fixing Ruby Part 4 Volume 2. Now, the big thing is that there were so many responses, and I'm so glad there were so many responses, that I can't individually address each and every single one. So what I did is I actually scrolled through every single comment I could, and I found the most important uh, questions, and I boiled them down into a list of major questions and answers. And I, I answered them out. I, I have bullet point answers right here off to my side. So sadly, I won't be mentioning you by name, even though there are some of you that were very prolific with your questioning. Very good questions, what I add. There were some excellent, excellent queries in there. Um, but I cannot physically touch on every single one of the individual ones. So I'm gonna try and condense them all into to big mega questions that I can answer in, in, a, in a very quick and efficient way. First up, it was changing Team Sun to Team Season, which being Scarlet, Sun, um, Sage, and Neptune. And the reason why I changed it uh, the way I did was because, first off, Team Sun is just really lame. Um, I, I think I mentioned that in the video itself, but also because a key change that I forgot to mention, and this was something that was pretty major, and it's on me for not putting it in directly, Scarlet is the leader of the team, not Sun. It always kind of baffled me as to why Sun was made the leader of the team. Now, Ruby, she has leadership potential. Even John has leadership potential. You can kind of see fledgling moments of it. But Sun never really seemed like a leader. He seemed more like the, the emotional heart of the team, more around the yang of his team. So, with that being said, who would make the most logical leader? Neptune obviously has his own issues. He's more of an equivalent to Weiss. Um, and Sage is the quiet one. He's obviously the the the, the uh, Blake equivalent. So then that leaves is seemingly Scarlet. And I know that we don't know much about Scarlet or or even Sage. I'm, I'm making an assumption that Sage is, is a quiet person. But Scarlet always seemed like he'd be the more talkative one. He's voiced by freaking Gavin. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of him being the leader in this circumstance. So that's why Team Sun was changed to Team Season partially. Um, I also, there was one comment in there about changing his name to Ember. I don't agree with that aspect. Scarlet's just fine. I mean, they've had repetition, re repeating letters before, so it works out relatively the same as it would have. So there's that my rationale behind that. I hope that satisfies people. Uh, next up is when Weiss snaps at her servant. Uh, there was an interesting comment about how this just makes her look callous towards anyone that's not Faunus. It makes her look incredibly shallow because she stops not because he's a person, but because he's a Faunus. And it's a little bit of yes, it's a little bit of no. It's a mix of shame and self-awareness. She berates him, and when she sees he's a Faunus, it triggers her morality alarm. So first it's like, oh, he's a Faunus, I shouldn't be treating Faunus this way, and then even deeper it goes, oh, wait, no, I shouldn't be treating anyone this way, they're still human. So, the, the, she pulls back when it hits that lower morality. It, it, she has like that moment of freezing when she stops herself, where like her mind goes through these different levels of processing. And, I mean, small details can help to flesh that out, where she not only looks at the guy who's lifting the bags, but also maybe the scared other attendants as well. It'd be interesting to see her react to them, and sort of be hesitant to even interact with them now that she's kind of in this mindset. Um, so, my intent from the beginning go there was not to show that she's only hesitant towards Faunus, it's towards everyone, but Faunus be being so important with you know so so formative in her her first year at Beacon is the trigger point, if that makes any sense. I, I hope that does. Next was a wonderful wonderful suggestion to use exhaustion slash aura depletion as an explanation as to why Sun and Neptune don't get back into the Paladin fight, as well as uh, explain why Pyrrha exactly used her semblance 
in a more, in a less refined fashion, I should say, during the Mercury fight. Why she might have accidentally outed herself during that fight. She was tired from her previous fight, which I, again, I, I made the Cardinal versus Pira fight very, uh, much more intense than it was in the original volume. So I actually really like that suggestion, and I'm more than willing to, to concede that that is a, a logical point to explain away those instances. So thank, thank you for the uh, 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 suggestion. I, I wanted to say something else there, but my internal synonyms weren't, weren't popping up. You might see that a lot in any other video. I, have a, I try to come up with an internal synonym, and I just they kind of default back to like something very basic. Now, another one that kind of cropped up, and I would say this is more along the lines of the Weiss argument from last volume, is Sun's reaction to being beaten, which a lot of people said he would fight back, he would get up, he would run. I took that into account. In fact, I went back and forth with Fat Man on this quite a bit when I was still developing and hashing out the script. In fact, this scene in particular got a lot of revision um, because it needed a lot of tweaking. Uh, initially, there was going to be a lot more interaction. We were talking, like, Coffee getting involved. We were talking Juniper getting involved directly. It had to be slimmed down in my initial drafts. And then when Fat Man got it, it had to be refined even more. Um, but when it came to Sun and the way he was treated and the way he reacted to it, he couldn't have run because Cardin was right there. It's very His veritable presence was the prevention of escape. And when it came to the guys actually trying to hurt him, the bad guy, the, the, the guards couldn't hurt him. The guards could not in any way hurt him. It, it was tickling him. I make that an absolute point. His aura, his training, these guys were nothing. They're just glorified, I don't know, like I said, wet noodles. Their legs were wet noodles. Oh, I got a message. Uh, so, with that, his other option would be to fight back. And if you were to fight back, well, this is a little bit of world building that you're not exactly seeing, and I feel kind of guilty about that, but at the same time, it makes sense in character. But having lived in Mistral for at least a, you know half a year at this point, if maybe not a full year, uh, he recognizes that the police in assault cases tend to side on the side of humans. Even though Vale is a little bit lighter on the, the racism, he does recognize that it exists. He's not blind to it, and he also doesn't quite know Vale as well as he knows Mistral, so he errs on the side of caution. He's a much smarter monkey than you give him credit for. Um, he also doesn't really feel like fighting back. It's kind of like his laissez-faire uh, uh, mentality, his, his idea of that. So he doesn't really give a damn. He decides talking his way out is his best bet. I mean, running his mouth typically works out for him. He hopes. Now, there was a suggestion as to why Penny was not involved in the breach. Now, logistically, the reason Penny was not involved in the breach was because I already had... four teams, not to mention a whole group of hunters involved with the White Fang, the Lieutenant, and the Grim themselves. Logistically, that entire scene was a nightmare to pen. I can only imagine what kind of a nightmare it would be to animate that kind of fight scene, and how long it would take to render that kind of fight scene. So that's logistically why she's not in there, is because she's kind of OP. You know, she, would, she would blow her way through a lot of shit. Uh, but particle effects, the, the, the fact that the swords are all independent entities, like, just from an animator's perspective, that would be just overwhelming for any kind of processor. Um, I mean, we would have a lot of those jumps where people just disappear in the background just to have that on screen and render in a timely fashion. Um, but story-wise, it also makes sense because Ironwood is still protecting her. He doesn't want her in actual combat. He said that as much, and that there's a reason why... Uh, 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 he doesn't send her out. She's not traveling around with Ruby like she was in the previous volume. She's she's not doing any of that. So she's not directly involved and Ironwood is obviously going to stop her from going. So her appearing and, and saving the day doesn't make much sense. Um, 
And, you know, this is also kind of a differentiation between Ironwood and Ozpin. Uh, Ozpin is comfortable sending unknowns into combat. He doesn't mind sending Ruby out to Mountain Glen. He doesn't mind, you know, taking a gamble on a basically a completely fresh team going out with only a little supervision to handle huge amounts of Grimm. Ironwood is much more cautious. He doesn't he doesn't like taking risks. He sends in what gets the job done and gets the job done. It's a difference in an in, in opportunity. And while both methods have been proven have proven themselves, it's just a differentiation between characters. Now here comes another big one. Another really big one. Is Velvet's weapon. My description in the video proper was lacking, and I apologize for that. There was a lot to get to, and I didn't want to bog down the, the entire video with describing it. It's a far more complicated device than just a grenade launcher. It's not stealing Nora's thunder like a lot of people claim. Nora has a traditional rotary grenade launcher. Velvet has a rotary... it has a rotary base in it when it pops out of the box. But it also works between, it's sort of like an unfolding cross between a mortar and a crossbow. Uh, and a standard grenade launcher, uh, uh, all the same. Uh, and this gives it an, a distinct advantage at range. It can bombard opponents from, from far away, which is what she did with Carden. She actually uh, uh, fired from a range and then got up close using a close range variant upon it. Um, and with that, she can actually load both the mortar and the, the crossbow grenade launcher uh, with two different types of ammunition at once and fire them at once. So she actually has the, the ability to, to send more ammunition down range much more quickly than a lot of other heavy hitters. Um, this also uh, plays into her as a character because she has her photography thing, that's a hobby, yes, but her true specialization when it comes to being a huntsman is being an alchemist. She, she specializes in uh, dust manipulation, dust, you know, uh, 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 combination and reconfiguring. Kind of like exactly the caster that Monty called her. And this is where I think that them slapping animation on her in the original volume was nowhere near what they intended because Monty very much when he was describing what outfit she would be wearing for the fan contest described her as a caster which I thought was really strange when she showed up as a I guess a blue mage is that is that is, I guess that's the term or is it the red mage um but I was more imagining something like a black mage you know, a, a character that used spells and such. But since we already have like that, and we have that kind of in Glinda, and since magic doesn't actually exist in this setting, uh, aside from the Maidens, I think that an alchemist is the closest you're going to get. Um, so, not only can is that playing into she can make her own ammunition, she can make her own ammunition on the fly, inside the box, in a separate compartment underneath, uh, is actually a alchemical studio that she can use to mix things on the fly. So if she needs a certain type of dust, if she have enough, if she has enough raw ingredients, she can mix that kind of stuff together. I'll hopefully be able to showcase more of that in volume th or season three. Um, but that was my entire opinion behind it. I'm glad that I. I decided to sit down and actually hash it out to you guys. Uh, but that was planned from even before volume one was finished uh, or, or season one i finished penning it next big one the lieutenant's survivability and possible semblance i'll touch on the semblance in a bit but the lieutenant is somewhat of a a, a challenge at least his role in this story is a challenge to an assertion that was made by a number of people in my lore video when i when i went into what aura was where a lot of people were critiquing my aura system that it would show the show would become all about matching power levels. The lieutenant probably had one of the most powerful auras of any character in the series. You know, it, it had the most damage reduction combined with some of the most duration. So he could tank like a boss and hit back hard like a boss. He was the high power level watermark. 
but it's the show that just having a good aura won't necessarily save you. He gets knocked into the grim, and just sheer numbers overwhelm him. You can take down someone that powerful being smart. Now, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, yeah, it definitely comes down... There, There is some power leveling to have. But again, if you're smart, say like Neo versus Yang, you can take down a superiorly equipped opponent with smart tactics. Um, so that was sort of my interpretation of... Or that was my intent, not interpretation. That was my intent with... Uh, um, the lieutenant and how strong he was. He was supposed to be this unstoppable force that was stopped because people were smart. Next up is uh, the lieutenant and card and semblances, which were suggestions uh, by a number of different people. Um, it never really crossed my mind to give either of them semblances because the series proper hasn't, and I realized it's a failing of the series that's reflecting upon my own thinking because I wasn't considering that. Um, but because consider, but considering Cardin's expanded role that I've given him, it's probably best that I do so, and so I'll get on thinking about it. I'll, I'll start tweaking it around, and hopefully we'll be able to, to see that in Season 3. Um, as for the Lieutenant, he wasn't really relevant due to just the overwhelming power of his aura. Again, this goes back to what I said, uh, I've said multiple times and reactions and such, People specialize in what they're good in. The lieutenant was good with his aura. Aura was his thing. So he worked on it and framed his fighting style around it. As opposed to, say, Yang, who frames her fighting style around her semblance. Or Ruby, for that matter. Um, or Velvet, who frames it around dust. Semblances can help. But his was either negligible or played into his ability as is. So you could either say, oh, it was something that helped him supercharge his, his aura if it makes you feel better. Um, but honestly, it was probably something useless, like the ability to talk to goldfish. The cracker variety. Now, before we continue any further, I would love to give a lovely shout out to all of my wonderful patrons and everyone in the Discord server, as well as to welcome new patron Rudy, who is already someone present on the Discord server, though I believe through Fatman's Patreon. So I want to welcome him very warmly to uh, my side of the aisle, and uh, I would like to encourage you all as well to sign up if you like the content that you're getting. I would very much like to have you on board helping me produce these videos and it, honestly they do take a lot of time they do take a lot of effort even something like this i had to sit down for a solid two or three hours just trying to sort out every single thing in here and making sure everything was internally consistent i have had to rewatch my entire video series like four times to make sure i'm not crossing over my own feet um so if you want to support the channel please my patreon is in the description down below it's in the i cards um, it's at the in the end cards. I would very much like to have you guys on board. Welcome to Rudy, and thank you to everyone that already supports me. Back to the video. Now comes the question about Cinder and what power she demonstrates thus far in my season fixing. Uh, Cinder's glass is it semblance, maiden power, or dust? It's a combination of aura and dust. It's a technique that uses dust as the primary method of attack. Her semblance is uh, a snap deflection field that blocks projectiles. Something that we saw in Volume 1, the, the canon, the actual Volume 1 of the series, where she blocks Ruby's bullets. That was her semblance, it's creating momentary deflection fields. The maiden powers are all the ones that create like fire and shit and lightning. Basically, pure energy base attacks. Uh, so I hope that clarifies all of her skill. Where the coolest stuff she does is honestly her own. The, the fire and shit, the, the boring maiden things are maiden things. Who are the extras that I put with Cinder's crew? Now, if you recall that I actually, when Ruby finally, or for the first time, meets Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury, I gave them two extra teammates uh, on just to kind of fill up the cast. They, they're not there. They're not there for any kind of importance. They're just extras there to fill out the team and will be handedly forgotten. They're not in on anything. They're not actually super secret spies. 
They're actual Haven students who are just Haven students. They're, they've been roped in sort of just as a cover for, for Cinder, em Emerald, and Mercury. Um, that said, the character models I used for them, that's Kirika and Muriel from the uh, anime Noir, which I do highly recommend. It's, it's a very good show. Um, especially if you like subterfuge, espionage, and uh, cute girls kicking ass. Now here's a comment that I've gotten from about three different people, one of them being Luke, who has been very vo vocal about it as well. And I, even Fatman, actually. Fatman uh, has made commentary about this before. I keep the show PG because that's what they were going for. That's what they were, they were aiming for, a PG-13 demographic. Um, but at the same time, it's also sort of the same target line for most shonen shows. And that's sort of what Ruby is inspired by. So it's in keeping with the theme, tone, and ability, and I think we can get most extreme things done on a PG-13 basis. I think we can push that to its furthest boundary, and we'll be fine. I mean, Legend of Korra dealt with frickin' PTSD, and as much as people bashed that show, I still applaud it for making that attempt. So, I mean, torture, PTSD, murder, we can do that stuff, just gotta be smart with it. And I, I find the, the restriction kind of refreshing and keeping me on my toes. I, I, I have to refrain from characters giving F-bombs and shit. That's, that's fine by me. It makes me a much better writer in the, in the process. If people are wondering why I don't make it more obvious that Ospin is the leader of the Yellow Brick Bunch over there, and I don't really think it needs clarification. I, I, I have all the characters coming to him. He's always the point of authority for just about everyone. And I didn't cut that line from Ironwood, where he says, I have served you faithfully for years, because that still fits in character. And technically speaking, that's still left in. I, I never cut it. I never cut that scene. That scene still happens. He got small tweaks to fit revision, but that line didn't need revision. So I don't know why I needed to specify that. Ospin's the leader. He's a laid-back leader, but he's the leader. End of story. Now there was a question in there about whether or not Yang would have more intense feelings towards Summer since she actually knew her for a couple of years as opposed to Ruby, who really didn't know Summer all that much. Now... It's true that Yang definitely loved Summer very much and had a very strong emotional connect connection with her, but after learning about Raven and the abandonment issues sort of sunk in a little too deep, a little too quickly, and it kind of started usurping her priorities. So while she had a strong emotional connection with Summer, Summer is more important to Ruby be and Raven is more important to Yang. It's illogical, but the human mind doesn't necessarily work on logic. And considering this is about depression, abandonment, and all those types of things, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think throwing ration out the window for this particular instance is actually a benefit. And that's something that I touched upon earlier when I renamed Team Season, but there needs to be more Team Season interaction. It's pretty hard to actually play up season considering how little we actually know about the other two members i'll do what i can in the future but i make no promises ruby's character bloat is really starting to catch up with me and volume three is going to be so so hard to balance with all the new characters coming in and their prominence in the series i mean just like fox and yatsuhashi they kind of got pushed to the wayside and i don't know if they're going to come back out necessarily I can't wait till I can call the herd and maybe come back and touch upon other characters in a little more depth at later points. Uh, now, this one I do know for a fact was from a specific, from a specific person, Dark uh, Three Hundred Three, because I did write that down. Uh, but talking about a gap in redundancies for the auto cannons as to why there was an issue, because they pointed out that most security systems such as an auto security, you know, an auto turret security system, would have a fair amount of overlap between the farthest two, uh, 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 um, the farthest two cannons. So we'd have three cannons, two here, one here. So one, two, three. 
These two would basically overlap somewhere in the middle here to provide at least emergency protection in case the middle one went down. In Vale's case, one went down and the other two did not have the overlap necessary to actually defend that middle area and thus the Grimmick getting into the city. Um, I like that explanation. I, I like going with that explanation because I didn't really touch too much in detail on how the autocrannons super worked. I just gave the broad overview. Um, but it's a very, very solid uh, uh, um, explanation. And having Ironwood bring it up as a fault of Ozpin's defense of the city would be even more compounding to the council giving command over to Ironwood. Though it would also make the, the council have a little egg on their face. So they're kind of trying to shift the blame off onto Ozpin as opposed to themselves. Now here was a good question. Do Faunus even have a culture? In a sense they do, in a sense they don't. They've developed one collectively during the, the CCT era. Uh, during the time of the CCT. Uh, combining bits of different Faunus cultures across the globe with Menagerie's culture, and then in reverse, Menagerie's out, uh, outsourcing and influencing Faunus in other countries, and it becomes sort of a wave effect where they bounce off each other and form uh, a new culture themselves. So they kind of departed in general from human, but still able to integrate with human. It, it's, it's not super defined, because it does have still localized specialties. There are still specialties to the Faunus and Vacuo versus the Faunus and Atlas. But it's there. There is a common thread that has developed among most Faunus uh, cultures. And here's a question that caught me off guard, because I hadn't considered it, and I, I feel embarrassed that I hadn't, but the economics of dust and the thefts and how that would affect an economy. Um... But I, I hadn't ever really considered it, but dust prices would be going up throughout the entirety of seasons two and uh, season one and two, especially considering uh, uh, season three is where they probably stop and they probably have enough stock uh, 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 enough stock to support their little rebellion. But um, it would actually tie nicely into why Velvet didn't whip out her weapon initially in uh, season uh, at the end of season two here. Because, well, it's expensive to use her weapon now. It is more than expensive. I guess anyone with ammunition would would be kind of reeling from how pricey things were starting to get. Um, but I hadn't really considered it. Dust prices would be going up and it would be affecting characters. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'll have to be more aware of that in the future because I, I think economics are a very important facet of world building. Um, something that I think Ruby itself forgets about, and something that I tried to emphasize in my history story, so, or my, my history uh, 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 re reboot for this. So, you know, back in part two. Let's bring it up. Now, there's another complaint that Roman isn't quite as racist as he used to be, and um, it's sort of accidental with the way that I, 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 I've restructured the story. But he doesn't really not racist, it's just he has other things to focus on, so it kind of fell to the wayside. Um, the problem is that Roman is smooth around them. He knows how to play it safe, uh, he, so he's very careful with his words, especially around people like the Lieutenant, because, in all honesty, the Lieutenant is a pretty strong dude. Um... And he does still get some jibes in. I mean, I I wrote that very opening moment with Roman as him be in season two, him being kind of condescending towards uh, 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 the Faunus with saying proper workers because his last workers were Faunus and they kind of futzed everything up. Well, to be fair, Ruby intervened, but... So, he's not not racist, but he's also not super racist, so I guess it has been toned down a touch. It's still there, though. More or less, he just cares about getting the job done when in, when in the heat of things. Um, when he's confiding with Neo is probably when it probably comes out most. Probably, probably, probably. Probably, probably. Now, here's one where I have to admit fault. Uh, Weiss's conflicting motives for going to Beacon, which were... 
comparing between volume uh, season one and season two. In season one, I said that she wanted to escape her family, while in season two, it was more about self-defense. This is where I'm willing to say that I fucked up and did not cross-reference myself properly. However, the beauty of this problem is that it finding a way to merge them together into a more complex dynamic makes this a more interesting writing process and makes her a more interesting character. It's sort of like what I did with Yang in the same scene, with her explaining her own motivation and how her party girl persona matched with someone dead set on finding her mother. It's a direct conflict in her own personal being. So for example, just off kind of what my notes here, upon deciding to become a huntress, Jock killed the idea almost immediately, which was the first time she'd ever been told no. Her persistence drives a wedge between her and Jock, which leads her to realize how shallow her life actually is. Eventually he gives in, lets her train under winter, or at least lets her train and then winter picks up from that surreptitiously, and stipulates that if she can win a fight of his making, the night armor, against the night armor, she can go. When she wins, he agrees to let her go to Beacon, which is still his way of controlling her. So it's sort of like one beat led into another. Because she wanted to better protect herself, she started understanding that she herself was not free and that she was still bound by her own rules. Now I might refine that, I might tweak that a little bit to, to, to uh, uh, give more explanation and considering that winter is showing up in the next season, that might be a great time to pop that kind of stuff out. But uh, for now, that's sort of an example of how I can try and rectify those two conflicting issues. Uh, and I thank you very much for pointing that out. I, I feel I'm going to have to do a much better job of keeping myself in track when it comes to character consistency. Uh, next question was, why Neo-Roman don't use sign language? I actually love the idea of them using sign language. I, I, I adore it, but I think she'd only use it for incredibly detailed circumstances. You know, having Roman understand it, not necessarily use it, but understand it, and she could use it only to really describe super important stuff, things that need detail. Um, but primarily she uses facial expression because they know each other so well. Her facial expressions tell a story enough to Roman to get her, her reaction to things. Um, it's the sort of way that a lot of pets are written in media where... <laughs> I, my cat actually perked at that. Uh, where you talk to them or where the character talks to their pet, and their pet sort of seems to understand them, and their pet seems to talk back to them, in a way. So, I don't want to boil Neo down to a pet, but it's sort of like that. The wordless exchange works just fine, I think. Maybe some sign language here or there, but uh, it depends again on the animators. Got to think about those poor guys and how crazy that is for them. We're not trying to win awards, we're just trying to make some fun videos here, some fun stories. Now, people have started pointing out the problems with ice and the train wheel and how there wouldn't be enough friction for it to heat up and break the ice or melt the ice. Look, I'm not very good at physics-related things. But for real... Stupid thing keeps dying on me. For real, that's just one explanation for why the ice might have uh, uh, worked or might not have worked. The, the main takeaway is that the ice doesn't work at all. The, the ice does not work to stop the train, and that means they have to go up to the front. Whatever reason, the ice doesn't end up working. I think the best explanation then at this point is just sheer momentum prevents it from freezing it in place. It doesn't freeze fast enough to halt the momentum of the train. Uh, but ultimately, this takeaway is the ice doesn't work. They try, but it doesn't work. Another question I get, I think two other people commented on this, how does torture work with Aura? Again, does no one pay attention to my videos? Aura works as damage reduction. It's not a one-to-one -one shield. It's not the Halo shield, and that's why I hate the way they described it as a Halo shield. That's not, I think, what Aura is intended to be. Say, for example, I have an Aura with the strength of an arbitrary number. Three. The strength of three. And someone with a, hit me for a bat, with a bat for a, a damage number of ten. My aura absorbs three points of that damage, and I still take seven of that damage. 
So if someone comes and they hit me hard enough to break my elbow, my, my aura would shield me from that, and I'd still get a very nasty bruise and maybe even some kind of uh, a, a fracture in my bone on my elbow, uh, depending on how strong my aura is. If I had a really strong aura, I'd just bounce off. Um, if anyone is familiar with Pathfinder, it works kind of like a belt of stone skin, or the, the power stone skin, where you get damage reduction up to a point. And you have a total number of damage you can actually reduce, and it incrementally ticks down by however much damage you take. So, for example, so it, it's it's kind of hard to describe. It, it, it's a it's a very difficult thing when you don't see it in action. But if you're familiar with Pathfinder, that's the, the nearest equivalent I can give you. Now, what was Tortric doing at the actual White Fang encampment? Um, he was overseeing dust shipments. That's, that's pretty simple, I think. The cabin really isn't as nice as I portray it as. It's more like a bunk. It's like a room. I just said ca cabin was, was just what came to mind, so I wrote it. But like I said, it, I was debating what term to call it, but really it was just him where he was staying while he was overseeing all the dust shipments coming in. Especially since, you know, between there and Vale was an overwhelming distance of, well, nothing and grim. Now, here's an interesting comment that kind of I shook my head at. Is, am I trying to make Ruby more noir? And I think someone really doesn't understand what noir is. And I'm not talking about noir the series, ironically, like I mentioned earlier. I'm talking about noir as in the genre. So... It's not really important, but as someone who has studied noir, I, I wanted to cover this. I wanted just to kind of refute this on camera. This is not noir. Roman's inspiration and behaviors come from stereotypical noir tropes, even if the core show just take... Uh, uh. Roman's inspiration and behaviors come from stereotypical noir tropes, even in the core show. Just... I just take it and put it to its logical ends with more screen time. The only reason you might think this is... Uh, the only reason you might think that is because Noir has an incredibly strict trend of clearly defining characters and giving them intriguing dynamics between one another. There's a lot of mystery, there's a lot of suspense, there's a lot of, lot, lot of character dialogue going back and forth. I can admit my own bias that Noir could have snuck in there on its own just from, from my own history of studying it, but largely this is something that the show just developed into its logical uh, extremes, to its logical ends. Um, so maybe it's a bit Noir, maybe it's not, maybe you're just confusing the, the, the genre. I'm not sure. We're nearing the end here. Second to last question is, why was Raven on the train? That is a very good question, and that ties back to her semblance, which we are keeping. It's a silly semblance, but expanding what it does is actually kind of important. When you think about what her semblance is, we think it's just teleporting to someone. But I think it's more than that. It's a protective guardian instinct. She protects people who are close to her. And thus, to do that, she needs to be able to teleport to them. But also need to know when to teleport to them. So, she can actually read Yang, Tai Yang, Crow, and Vinal, uh, Vernal's aura to tell if they're in danger. So, when Yang gets the shit kicked out of her by Neo, that sends up red lights to, uh, uh, to Raven, who pops in and protects her. It's why she says that everyone gets one. She's not, she doesn't want to be emotionally attached, but she can't help herself but be. And so she gives that, that, that dixture that she's not going to show up a second time. I think that's fair. I, I think that's a more interesting semblance, or at least interpretation of her in semblance, than we've gotten in the show yet. And finally, this one is just a reiteration of something that, again, I've said on numerous occasions before. Semblance and aura being connected. 
Semblance is unlocked with Aura, but is not powered by it. Semblance works like a kind of muscle. It's a supernatural force that is powered by just the general user's stamina. Now, you can funnel your Aura into your stamina to give it an extra boost, uh, but eventually then your Aura runs out. So you can, you, can, you can power your Semblance via Aura, but that's a dangerous technique in a firefight, in an actual fight itself. I hope that clarifies things. And I certainly hope you guys enjoyed this video on covering all the big key point issues that people had with Fixing Ruby Part 4, Volume 2. <laughs> or Season 2. I can't remember which I titled the actual video. I think it was Volume 2, just because most people recognize Volume 2. Um, once more, a lovely shout out to all my wonderful patrons, everyone in the Discord server, to Rudy. And if you felt like you liked what you saw here, please leave a comment down below telling me so. Like the video, and also if you felt that you had disagreed with something, leave a comment for that. Let me know if you disagree with something on here. Let me know if I screwed up and contradicted myself. I want to know. I want to improve. I want to, to, to see my art form grow. So I can't do that without you guys keeping me in check. Thank you all so much for watching, and catch you all on the flip side.